Okay, let's unpack this because uh, the whole space landscape, it's really being redrawn right now. It absolutely is. And by 2025, wow, China has seriously positioned itself as a, well, a major force in that shift. Yeah, definitely. We've pulled together some really interesting material for this deep dive. Good stuff. It really shines a light on their, you know, rapid progress and just how ambitious their vision for space is. Exactly. So we're looking at China's space program, specifically where things stand in 2025. Our sources cover, well, quite a bit. Like what? Everything from their space station, which is now fully up and running, uh, their moon plans, Mars exploration, planetary stuff, yeah. their big satellite constellation projects, plus the whole commercial space sector that's booming over there. And importantly, how they're using space for international cooperation. Right. So the mission for everyone listening today, we want you to get a really clear, concise picture of where China stands in space right now. And what it means for the future. Yeah. Exactly. We'll try to skip the super heavy jargon, give you the key insights so you can quickly grasp why this is such a big deal globally. Makes sense. Get everyone up to speed. Ready to jump in? Let's do it. Uh, maybe start with something tangible, something actually orbiting above us right now. The Tiangong Space Station. Ah, Tiangong. Yeah. Fully functional in 2025. That's... Yeah. That's a massive achievement. It really is. And I hear it's pretty busy up there. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, the Shenzhou 19 crew, they went up late 2024, and they're the current residents. Okay. What are they up to? Well, the usual mix for a space station, really lots of science experiments, uh, doing spacewalks, EVAs. Right, extravehicular activities. Exactly. And interestingly, they're also doing upgrades specifically to make the station tougher against space debris. Well, that's smart. Space junk is a real problem. It's a huge problem. Even tiny bits moving that fast. <laughs> yeah. So it's a very active research hub. But it's more than just a lab for China, right? What's the bigger picture, the global significance of Tiangong? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. It's designed not just for China's own science. They're actively positioning it as a platform for uh, international collaboration. So inviting other countries up. Potentially, yes. But it's also, you know, strategic. It's a way to build relationships, maybe offer an alternative to the ISS model. Kind of challenge the uh, the Western-led way of doing things in space. You could see it that way, yeah. It definitely positions China as a leader in low Earth orbit, offering capabilities few others have right now. Mm, interesting. Space diplomacy via hardware. Right. Okay, so Tiangong's up there. Let's talk about where they're aiming next. The moon. Their plans are uh, pretty substantial. Substantial is putting it mildly. The big headline goal is a crewed moon landing by 2030. 2030? That's not far off. Not at all. And they're building some serious hardware to make it happen. Like, what, what are the key pieces of tech we should know about? Okay, so two main things to watch. First, the Mengzhu spacecraft. Think of it as their next-gen crew vehicle. Bigger, more capable. Yeah, designed to carry up to six astronauts. And versatile planned for lunar missions, but maybe even deep space down the line. Okay, Mengzhu, what else? Then there's the Lanyu Lunar Lander. That's the specific vehicle designed to take the crew down to the moon's surface and back up. Got it. So Mengzhu gets them to lunar orbit, Lanyu takes them down to walk around. Basically, yes. They're developing the whole transportation system. But it's not just about planting a flag and coming home Apollo style, is it? Their lunar plans seem more permanent. They definitely are. This connects to the uh, the bigger concept, the International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS. Right, the ILRS. That's the partnership with Russia. Primarily with Russia, yes, though they're inviting others. And the long-term vision here is ambitious. A permanent, or at least long-term, human presence on the moon sometime in the 2030s. A permanent base on the moon. Wow. That really shifts the paradigm. It's a huge leap, yeah. Okay, moon base plans noted. Let's shift focus even further out. Mars. They already had some big success there. Absolutely. Can't forget Tianwen-1 successfully getting an orbiter, lander, and the Zerong rover to Mars in 2021. That was a landmark mission. A triple threat. <laughs> sure, they could do complex deep space missions. Exactly. It laid crucial groundwork technically and experientially for what comes next. And what does come next for Mars? The plans get even bolder, right? They do. The next major step is a Mars sample return mission. Bringing bits of Mars back to Earth. Precisely, which is incredibly complex, but the scientific payoff could be enormous. And then the really big one. Boots on Mars. A crewed mission to Mars. They floated a target date around 2033. 2033. That feels almost like science fiction, but 
maybe not. It's incredibly ambitious. Huge hurdles remain, obviously, but it's on their roadmap. Imagine that timeline, though. It does focus the mind. Okay, <laughs> so reaching other planets. Yeah. But they're also looking out from space, right? With a new telescope. Yes, the Zuntian Space Telescope. This is a really interesting one. How so? Well, first, it's designed to fly near the Tiangong Station. Oh, why is that useful? It could potentially allow for servicing, upgrades, maintenance by astronauts from the station. Kind of like how the shuttle service Hubble. Ah, clever. And the telescope itself. The big thing is its field of view. It's designed to be much, much wider than Hubble's. So it can survey bigger patches of the sky faster. Exactly. It won't have Hubble's pinpoint sharpness in every case, perhaps, but it can map vast areas. Huge potential for discovering new things, understanding cosmic structure. A different kind of eye on the universe. Very cool. Okay, let's bring it back closer to home. Satellites. This seems to be another area of massive expansion for China. Oh, definitely. We have to talk about Qianfan. Qianfan. That's the Build Constellation Project, also called Space Sail or G60 Starlink. That's the one. And when we say big, we mean big. The plan is for over 15,000 satellites. 15,000. Seriously. Seriously. It's a staggering number. Uh -huh. As of 2025, they've already got uh, something over 90 launched, but that's just the very beginning. Wow. What's the main point of deploying that many satellites? Primarily, it's about global internet coverage, just like SpaceX's Starlink. Ah, so it's direct competition. Absolutely. A head-to-head -head race to build out this vital layer of space-based infrastructure for broadband internet. Which has huge implications, obviously. But it's probably not just about getting Netflix in remote areas, is it? There are likely other angles. Well, that brings up the whole dual-use aspect. Meaning civilian and military uses. Exactly. A constellation like that offers immense potential for communication, observation, data relay, capabilities that are obviously very interesting for military and intelligence purposes, too. Right. That adds another layer of complexity and, frankly, potential tension. It definitely does. How other nations react to such a massive deployment, especially given potential military uses, that's something to watch. Okay, so state-run projects like Tiangong, ILRS, Qianfan are huge. But what about the private side? China's commercial space sector seems to be really taking off too. It absolutely is. Ever since the government officially opened the door to private investment back in uh, 2014, it's just exploded. So that policy change was the catalyst. It seems like it was a major one, yeah. Now you've got this really vibrant ecosystem alongside the state programs. Who are some of the key private companies making waves? Well, there are quite a few now. Uh, Galaxy Space is a big name, focused on satellite systems, kind of tying into that constellation push. Okay. Then you've got companies like Landspace Technology and Deep Blue Airspace. They're both working hard on reusable launch vehicles. Ah, the reusable rockets. Yeah. That's the key to lowering launch costs, right? Like SpaceX pioneered. Exactly. It's seen as a game changer for access to space. And these Chinese companies are making rapid progress there. Others are looking at things like orbital services, too. So it's not just launch, it's satellites yeah. services. A whole range. A whole range. And the key thing our sources highlight is how quickly they seem to be closing the technology gap with say, uh, U.S. commercial space companies. Really? Catching up that fast? The combination of, you know, government encouragement, available capital, and a lot of engineering talent seems to be accelerating things significantly. Interesting. So does this private boom help or compete with the state programs? Or do they work together? It seems mostly synergistic, at least for now. Uh, the private sector brings agility, innovation, maybe lower costs, while the state provides the big strategic direction and often key contracts. It drives the whole ecosystem forward faster. Okay, that makes sense. Now, China isn't just doing all this internally. You mentioned international cooperation earlier. How does that fit into their strategy? It's a really important piece. They're using space capabilities quite deliberately as a tool for diplomacy space diplomacy. How does that work in practice? Well, look at regions like Africa, for instance. Egypt is a good example cited in our materials. China has helped them develop satellite capabilities, build ground infrastructure. So providing tech and expertise. Yes, mm -hmm. and training. But it's not just aid, right? There's a clear strategic goal here. Which is? Building alliances, expanding influence. By offering these space capabilities, often without the same strings attached as perhaps Western partners might have, they create dependencies and goodwill. Ah, so it's about offering an alternative partnership model. 
outside the established U.S. or European frameworks. Precisely. It enhances their geopolitical reach, particularly in the developing world. It's a smart, long-term play using space as leverage. Very strategic. Okay, this all inevitably leads to the big comparison everyone makes. Yeah. The U.S. versus China in space. It really does feel like a new space race, doesn't it? It certainly has that feeling, yeah. A modern space race, though, driven as much by technology and strategy as pure Cold War ideology. Right. So as of 2025, how do the two stack up? What are the main strengths of each side? Well, the U.S. obviously has NASA's incredible legacy. Decades of experience, especially in deep space. Think Artemis, the moon program. And the big private players, too, right? SpaceX, Blue Origin. Huge advantage. That public-private partnership model fosters a lot of innovation, drives down launch costs, creates a really dynamic industry. Okay, so legacy, experience, and strong commercial sector for the U.S. What about China's strengths? China's big advantage seems to be its uh, centralized coordination. The state can marshal enormous resources and make decisions very quickly top-down direction, less red tape, maybe. Something like that. It allows them to execute complex, long-term plans with, well, remarkable speed and focus. We've seen that with Tiangong, with the lunar program. So it's almost a contrast in models. The U.S. leveraging private innovation, China using state-driven efficiency. That's a good way to put it. And it's fascinating to see how these different approaches compete in such a high-stakes field. It's not clear yet which model is better long term. Maybe both have their place. In this competition, it's not just about getting to the moon first this time, is it? Oh, no. Much broader. We've yeah. touched on it already. Dominance in satellite constellations like Qianfan versus Starlink. Leadership in space research, Tiangong, Suntian. Commercial competitiveness. Absolutely. Who builds the best, cheapest rockets? Who offers the best satellite services? And then there's a race for international partners, like we discussed. It's multifaceted. So looking down the road, what are the biggest implications of this rivalry? especially thinking about things like lunar bases or getting to Mars. Well, space is just becoming increasingly critical, geopolitically, technologically, economically. Having control over lunar resources or being the first nation to establish a sustainable presence there or on Mars that carries immense weight. Prestige, power projection. All of that. This competition is likely to accelerate development, which could be good, but it also raises the stakes for potential conflict or friction in space. It's going to shape a lot in the coming decades. Okay, wow. That's a lot to take in. Let's try to sort of boil it down. If there's one key takeaway about China's space program in 2025, what is it? I'd say the main thing is just how comprehensive and coordinated their push is. They're not just dabbling. They have a clear strategy, and they're advancing rapidly across basically all major areas of space activity. Human spaceflight, moon, Mars, satellites, commercial. Yeah, the whole package. Supported by that growing commercial sector and smart international partnerships, they are, without doubt, a top-tier space power now. And for someone listening, why does this matter? What's the real significance beyond just China's own achievements? Because it's fundamentally changing the global space order. China's rise isn't happening in a vacuum. It's forcing other countries, especially the U.S., to react, to reassess their own plans, maybe to accelerate them. It injects a new dynamic. Exactly. It creates a more multipolar space environment, which affects everything from scientific collaboration to military strategy to how companies plan for the future of space-based services. It impacts innovation, global politics, the future of how humanity uses space. Right. Okay, really brings it home. So final thought then, something for our listeners to chew on. Yeah. Given this incredible pace of China's progress, this new space race, Yeah. what do you think might be the single most significant consequence we'll see in, say, the next 10 years? Not just for governments, but maybe for everyday tech, for global connections. Mm, that's a big question. Yeah. Like thinking about the dual-use side of things, like with Wien Fan or the sheer ambition of an international moon base. What development should we really be keeping our closest eye on? What's the ripple effect you find most intriguing or maybe even concerning? 